I'm Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Be inspired to live big and bold and take action to turn your dreams into your reality. Go beyond obstacles and limits of your thinking. Accelerate results to catapult yourself to success. I'm a visibility expert who gives media makeovers to clients, booking them on media interviews and turning their books into international bestsellers with guaranteed results. Join me at DebbieDashinger.com. Dare to do great things. Dare to shine. It's all about you becoming a visionary and leading the path. Welcome to your daring new life. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, and we have a really interesting conversation for you today on the show, and it's going to be about knowing things in advance of them occurring. And does that mean that there's actually a future self of you coming back and letting you know? Does that mean it's some kind of psychic ability? Is it a freak accident? Well, we're going to explore that a little more today in some conversation. And then we have an expert who is coming on to have that talk. Somebody who has studied this at great length and written New York Times bestsellers about it. And that's going to be author and cognitive neuroscientist, Julia Mossbridge. So I've got Rob Rowe here with me today, who actually interviewed Julia Mossbridge, which you'll hear later. And Rob, thanks for joining me and welcome. Always my pleasure. Hi, Debbie. How are you doing? I'm good. And I think that this is a really timely conversation because you and I actually had an experience of this yesterday. And so I think what I'd like to do is start with a little bit of the story of Julia, why she started exploring this and the dream she had. And then we can open this up to some conversation. Sound good? Sure. Okay. Besides writing the book she's written, there was an article in the Times of Israel where they interviewed Julia Mossbridge. And I'll just read you a little bit so you have the context of who she is and what happened, how she ended up here. It says, a few days after the death of her grandmother, Cognitive neuroscientist, futurist, and author Julia Mossbridge had a dream. In the dream, her grandmother said to her, You know, Julia, I always read the book from right to left. This is how little I knew about Judaism at the time, Mossbridge tells the Times of Israel in a recent interview during a U.S. book tour. I didn't know Hebrew was written right to left. But I told my mother about the dream, and she said, Oh, interesting. Hebrew is written right to left. Your grandmother wasn't Jewish, but that's interesting. It wasn't too long after the dream that the family came upon an heirloom her grandmother had been in possession of, a small scroll stored in a plastic baggie. The scroll had been in Mossbridge's father's family for generations. Accompanying it was a handwritten note which said, I am pretty sure this is a Chinese scroll passed down from one of our missionary relatives. Mossbridge took one look at the scroll and knew it was not written in Chinese. She was pretty sure, in fact, it was written in Hebrew. It would be a few more years and a few more strange but poignant, unexplainable occurrences connected to Judaism before Mossbridge would understand that she was, in her words, being called to the religion. She would convert at age 30 after, accidentally, stumbling upon a weekday Yom Kippur service in an auditorium at Northwestern University and being moved to tears by the rabbi's sermon on oneness. Now, 20 years later, Mossbridge, a fellow at the Institute for Noetic Sciences located not far from her home in Northern California, and a visiting scholar in the psychology department at Northwestern has co-authored a book that some might say is about strange, unexplainable occurrences. Mossbridge would likely disagree. In the Premonition Code, The Science of Precognition, it's about ordinary human beings having seemingly extraordinary experiences. Have you ever had a feeling something was going to happen and it did? Have you had a dream and then seen it play out in your waking life? 
Well, Mossbridge says that precognition is put into two bins, depending on if you're a scientist or not, but neither of the bins is accurate. Non-scientists tend to put precognition, even if they think it's real, into a bin of, wow, that's weird. Whereas most scientists think the pop culture belief in this stuff is misguided. And most don't know how rigorous these studies are, don't read the literature, and she says her least favorite are not even willing to take the time to talk to someone who does research on it. So she's passionate about it. She researches, she writes, she lectures. I'm going to skip to the punchline here so you understand what happened and how this enriched her life. She feels like her controlled precognition practice is like a meditation practice. It's a way of knowing what's in her soul and knowing herself over time. She says, I think of each of these events of our life beads on a necklace and controlled precognition is like making the necklace, making the connection between our past and future selves. There's something extremely strengthening and powerful about connecting with yourself over time. So she herself has a profound relationship with God since she was a small child, as well as being deeply engaged in scientific investigation since then as well. And she sees science as a spiritual path, as a mystical path. Here's what's interesting. Mossbridge says after all these years, her family still hadn't solved the mystery of her grandmother's Hebrew scroll. However, thanks to science, it turns out she comes from a genetically Jewish lineage. Because a few years ago, Mossbridge did 23andMe DNA testing. And the report says that Mossbridge indicated on her maternal haplotype the DNA sequence of one's mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited from one's mother and passed on mother to daughter, shows Ashkenazic Jewish ancestry. So she says, I knew I was 100% Scottish-Irish, but I found out I was scottish Irish, Jewish. Very interesting. She's a big ish, right? <laughs> Scottish, Irish, Jewish. So that's, that's the end of that story in particular. But I think that context is really important to understand that her experience is really incredible around religion. And nobody in her family, ostensibly knowing this, that she knew and then came to be able to prove it scientifically. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I had the good fortune to be able to interview uh, Julia at the uh, Conscious Life Expo. And one thing that really struck me about her is she's a really science-based person. You know, none of this stuff is taken on faith. None of it's really, well, this was just my experience and can't be duplicated. She's very methodical about our research. And a lot of it gets into stuff that's way above my pay grade to talk about in, in terms of physics. But when you listen to a lot of the physics guys that are out there, uh, you know, discussing these kind of things, you know, particularly, you know, the nature of time and space, you constantly hear that there is, you know, some sort of level or dimension, if you will, that has time existing in sort of a simultaneous mode. In other words, the linearity of time ceases to be linear and becomes more of a type of simultaneous type of uh, perception. And when you talk to people who conduct psychic abilities on a reliable basis, this is kind of what they talk about, is being able to access this particular dimension. And this is uh, sort of Julia's line of thought, too. So she's got a, a very methodical process that she uses. She actually teaches the process in her book, The Premonition Code. And I've been studying that book. I'm about halfway through it and find it to be uh, really methodical and in interesting and you know, following the scientific method. So we've, we've all had experiences where we felt that something was going to happen. I know I've, I've had them. Uh, you had one just recently, Deb, right, where uh, you, you had a pretty strong feeling that something was about to happen, and indeed it did. Well, yeah. Yesterday, you and I went to an expo, a conference, because my clients were going to speak there, and they asked us to come, and they had tickets for us. So we actually went to hear them on a panel some very notable speakers there. And you and I went in, it was an evening two-hour panel. And when we sat down, 
one of my clients walked over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, I know you're in the audience, but would you be willing to come up on stage and speak on the panel or moderate it? And I laughed and I said, yes, I would. And as soon as she walked away, I looked at you and said, I knew that was going to happen. And you asked, when did you know? And I had to think about that. My sense was as soon as we walked in that room, I knew I was, I was not going to be in the audience. I knew I was going to serve. I actually really felt strongly as the moderator. So I have had that happen actually many times. And that was as, as close as you can get to us having this conversation today, time-wise. Well, I've had it happen a couple times, too. There, there's been a couple times where I was in uh, you know, some sort of an event where they were having a raffle, as they often mm, do. You, yeah, might, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you might win a book or you might win some sort of a door prize, you know, sometimes maybe if it's an iPad or something like that. <laughs> uh, there was one particular time when I was at a graphics design conference, and there was a whole program of instructional material that was valued at about 1000 bucks. And I was looking at my ticket, and I just had the strongest feeling it was going to be me. And and there was a time lag of about maybe 20, 30 seconds before the number got called. And indeed, it was me. So these things are all very subjective and that sort of thing. But I think most people have had something like this happen. So what Julia's premise is, is that this ability, for one thing, can be developed. And the more that you have these kind of spontaneous little you know, glimpses of feeling that something might happen, and it does, the more it indicates that you actually have the ability to become what she calls a, a positive precog. And this is what her, her training in the uh, premonition code is, is all about. So uh, she, she gives a, a pretty good rundown in the book of what the characteristics are that would indicate maybe you have an ability to pursue this in a way that could you know, benefit your own life in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, one of the obvious things you know, any any time you see you a know, movie cartoon where somebody gets three wishes or something like that, one of the things they often ask for is the ability to see a week or two ahead into the stock market to gain fabulous wealth by investing in stocks they know are going to go up. You know, this is a theme I've seen in a few different movies. I think there's for sure it was in one of the, I think it was in Back to the Future 3 and so on. But there, it's, it's happened, you know, a few times. Well, let me and, ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So... Since you spent 30 minutes with Julia Mossbridge and you're halfway through the book, what is your takeaway? That's what I want to know is what is the big takeaway so we could learn something in this moment? What is something we can employ so we can mindfully start to have these experiences? I can tell you why this conversation is so interesting to me is because I feel like it's always been indiscriminate. As someone is a clear sentient, right? I've had people say, read me. I can't just read somebody. I receive a download when I do, and it's always truth. I know truth, truth, truth. I've totally had what you're talking about happen. Raffle, I'm winning. This is it. There's my, yep, there's my name. It's happened. And, and many other things. So I want to know if she's claiming we can mindfully do this and actually develop this like a muscle, what is one of the ways we can start to do that. Well, she lays it out very clearly. It, it, it's a whole multi-step process. The, the first part is you know, just basically laying a little bit of groundwork for yourself in terms of uh, ethics are a huge part of it, that if you do develop this ability, you would use it for uh, positive purposes. So she uses the term positive precog throughout the book. And there are, are a lot of applications ranging from probably the most simple and personal would be just for a sort of personal development to do it as a, a form of meditation and a, a form of getting to know yourself better, put yourself in alignment with your higher self, to be cognitive of that interdimensional type of awareness that might happen where part of yourself, call it your higher self, over soul, whatever terminology you want to use, might be in that non-linear time dimension that I mentioned earlier. I don't really know how to describe it in, in any better terms than that. There's a lot of physicists who will describe, you know, the multiverse and the, the different parts of physics that will, you know, support that theory and so on. But in terms of practical use in your own life, she's got a very clearly laid out uh, course, actually, in her book. The Can you give us one? Just give us one tip, if you remember. Well, the way it starts out is what she calls the higher self handshake. So this kind of gets into an agreement of ethics. So 
in, in terms of your conscious mind working with your super conscious mind, your your higher self, she uses to use that terminology or chooses to use that terminology. Um, you're making an agreement with that part of yourself to use this technology and use this science, which is what it really is. It's, it's not anything that is you know, described as some, an incredible gift that only some people have. She, she's very careful to describe it as something that people can develop and use. Some people, of course, better than others, depending upon their natural talent, just like playing the piano. But the, the higher self handshake is something that forms the groundwork of this whole process to get you on track to take it seriously, take it scientifically, take it methodically, take it step by step, and proceed with the various exercises that come after that that would uh, you know, lead you to the process of being able to use this effectively. I want to ask you about, so you have dreams, like pretty detailed dreams. It seems to me, and I don't know if this is precog, but it certainly seems to me you have visitations during your dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Like your brother certainly, it seems, has visited you several times. But I don't know if they're guides or what, but you come back and talk about dreams in... You know, everybody's always blown away when they hear hear the details. And even recently, when you had a flying dream, you expressed that you were able to start to employ being lucid within the dream. So you were actually choosing in the dream, right? The dream wasn't choosing for you. You were choosing what was going to happen, where you were going to fly. Do you feel like there's any relevance with precog in what you particularly experience in your dreams? Well, it's not so much what... I think it's kind of the the way Julia lays it out is that if you find yourself having certain abilities that might be interesting uh, in sort of a, a non-standard type of uh, perception, then that would give an indication you might have some innate talent as a potential positive precog. And, you know, some people can do this, you know, right out of the gate. You know, some people are very gifted and don't really need a lot of training to be able to make accurate predictions. And she gives plenty of examples of that. But the, the fact that she provides this training uh, and encourages people to pursue the, uh, the, the process if they have indications that they might be gifted in a sense is, is pretty encouraging. So yeah, I, I do plan to pursue it. I think that uh, I, I might have some indications. I may have like a, you know, a couple of the basic prerequisites. In other words, maybe there's a, you know, some ink in the pen that I might be able to uh, work with to maybe have some success at, uh, you know, pursuing your techniques. So yeah, yeah, I plan to do it. Well, what are some ways that people can use precognition? What are some benefits to having it? I mean, besides what you jokingly, and maybe not so jokingly, not so talked jokingly. about with the no, stock market, no, no, but, no, she's, she's, which almost, by the way, I wonder, it feels a lot like remote viewing. Yeah, there, that is part of it too. No, she no, she was very serious, uh, you know, about uh, you know achieving some success in the financial markets by using this type of intuition uh, to make you know financial choices and how they might play out. So yeah, that that's uh, not a joke at all. Uh, in the uh, conversation that I had with Julia, her husband was there. Her mm. husband had ch- chimed in at one point. You'll you'll hear on the uh, recording, and he mentioned that he finds uh, Julia to emerge from her precog sessions uh, much happier, more relaxed, kind of more glowing, so to speak. I think was the term he used. So there is definitely a uh, a meditational, uh, personal, mental health component to the whole process that. Uh, uh, it seems to be sort of a, a side benefit as long, uh, right alongside any actual technical capabilities of precognition. Okay. Well, I think we'll roll the interview. So stay with us so you can enjoy that. I want to thank you, Rob, sure. for covering me, for covering me. <laughs> well, for really stepping in and doing an amazing job with uh, some of the extraordinary people, seven, eight people you got to meet with, including Julia. And I think people are going to really enjoy what follows uh, as the Dare to Dream interview with Dr. Julia Mossbridge on precognition, the premonition code, and the science of precognition. 
Well, thank you again, Julia. If you happen to be listening to this, we did really enjoy your conversation, and I'm enjoying your book immensely. Learn at your desk teleseminars. Desire to fix your finances? Become a best-selling author? Execute your goals full circle from dream to done? Learn how to be interviewed on the radio for your business? Expert Debbie Dashinger teaches worldwide teleclasses. Her teleseminars receive rave reviews. Sign up for the teleclasses or receive the downloadable audios. Go to DebbieDashinger.com for your audio class now. What would you say if I told you that you could change your life in only one hour and all while lying down relaxing? Thousands of people all over the world have. What am I talking about? It's called Access Consciousness The Bars. The Bars is an energetic body process that contains 32 different points on your head that when run assist you in releasing decisions about any area of your life that you have made solid and as a result cannot change. The Bars is the first class in Access Consciousness a dynamic set of tools and information designed to transform any area of your life. When you have a bar session, the worst that can happen is you feel like you had a fantastic massage. The best thing that can happen is your whole life could change. Go to accessconsciousness.com today to find a facilitator to schedule a private session or to find a bars class in your area. Are you willing to give yourself an hour to change your life? Have a dream but not clear how to manifest it? Feel like the rest of the world was given the secret to achieving their dreams except for you? This acclaimed book, Wisdom to Success, The Surefire Secrets to Accomplish All Your Dreams, was written for you. Author Debbie Dashinger received the Inspiration Book of the Year Award and Critics Pick from U.S. Book Review and Writer's Digest for Wisdom to Success. It's a life-changing read, available at Amazon. We are live at the Conscious Life Expo, February 2019. This is Rob Rose standing in for Debbie Dashinger of the Dare to Dream podcast. I have the very good fortune to be here with uh, Julia Mossbridge. Julia, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks. It's awesome to be here, Rob. All right. Oh, gosh. So many things to talk about. I'm going to assume that a lot of our listeners will know something about you, so I won't do the usual thing of, you know, tell us how you got here and your whole life story and all that. So I, I'd like to just jump in. You've got a phenomenal book out right now called The Premonition Code, and I was very fortunate to get my hands on a copy. I've been working my way through it, and one thing that I think is unique about your work, or many things, but w- one thing that really stands out is you have a very detailed training program to help people do what you do. And it's a step-by-step, it, it, and does it lead to some sort of a certification, something like that? No. What it leads to, <laughs> it's funny, I was, we were toying with that. My co-author, Teresa Chung, and I were toying with this idea of a certification. Um, the problem with a certification is that it ends up creating a situation where all these people are writing you saying, why don't you certify me because of X, Y, and Z? And we, neither of us wanted that. So what we want people to do is rely on themselves to go to the website, to do the work, to develop their own practice in whatever the way they want. And then they can go out and use it however they want. Right now there's no certifying body for people who you do this kind of work. Maybe eventually we'll have a standards committee and all that stuff. But right now it's just the very beginning of the positive precog movement. And it's the very beginning of the precog economy, as we call it. So that stuff just doesn't exist yet. Not quite ready to build that. It may be happening in the future. Well, that's a super fascinating aspect of it because it seems that we are you know, just right on the, on the precipice of a whole new class of uh, careers. Uh, you made a very interesting example in the beginning of your book about somebody buying a car yeah. and going to a precog at the Nissan dealership or wherever it was that uh, it was going to give them uh, an idea of whether that's really the best choice for their you know, personal style of driving, safety, whether, how well that car would work out for them in the future. What are, what are some other examples? Uh, you, you made a couple more in, in your book. What are other things that people might think about this skill set for sure. as far as you know, actually going out and functioning in the material world? Yeah, I mean, basically every area. So we can go down the list. So financially, clearly. Clearly. <laughs> not so hard to think about how to do that. Um, in fact, that if enough people get skilled at this, the rules of the uh, stock market might have to change in some way. But in any case... Um, uh, so financially, it's pretty clear. If if you can 
accurately look into the future at a rate that's higher than, say, 60%, you're going to do well uh, financially. Uh, education. Um, looking at five to ten years down the road, seeing what kinds of jobs are useful and then training students in those areas could create um, a country's educational system that's incredibly beneficial because it's looking ahead, right? Um, healthcare. Someone uh, works in a hospital staffing the emergency room has to figure out when the accidents are going to be over the next week, staffs the doctors and nurses accordingly because they have this ability. Really? They, they can, that, that's a real thing? You could actually... You I'm know, saying if people get to the, the area where enough people are... The, the, the time when enough people are skilled in this area, we're going to find people who are skilled in that particular thing. There are different kinds of skills. There are some people who are really good at looking into mood... Um, some people are really good at looking at physical elements and have not very interested in looking at people. There's other people who are good at looking at um, biologicals that are non-human, so any kind of animals or aliens, if we ever have those happening around here or if they are happening. You've got people who are really good at um, traveling backwards or forwards mentally in time. So just the more these skills become popular and, and people can get it that they're not crazy necessarily. I mean, there's crazy people out there, but like that if they, that they could actually hone the skill and have it be useful, the more we'll find that there are particular people who have abilities that can be used in various areas. So like, for instance, scientific research, right? I'm a scientist. That's really where my passion is. That's why I got into this whole thing. I started training myself in this area because I was studying this stuff. And I felt like a, like an ethnomusicologist who never learned an instrument. I thought, that's right. ridiculous. I have to learn this. I'm kind of okay at it. I'm not amazing, I don't think, because I've just started. You know, I've, All my life I've had spontaneous experiences, but I've just started controlled precognition where I'm sitting down and I'm doing it. But um, to, me, to me, the science of it is partly compelling because if we could use this ability to actually get insights scientifically... So say you're working on trying to figure out the gene for lung cancer. What if you have a, a positive precog who works alongside you, knows all the lingo, and can say, well, it looks oh. like in six years we find it on gene 33. Well, maybe we can make that two years instead of... You could of, change the needle in the haystack to the needle in a small pile of straw then. Yeah, I'm except afraid. there is no gene 33, sorry. I mean chromosome 33, sorry. <laughs> but yes, if we were another species. But yes, right, you could, you could hone... Um, you could hone and speed up scientific research, including research into things like precognition. So it could be very circular. You, you mentioned something a minute ago I kind of have to ask you about. You, you were talking about the emergency room and predicting accidents. Now, the word accidents seems to imply that uh, it's a random occurrence or else it wouldn't be an accident. So is that, is that a real thing? I mean, is there really some way to tell if some guy is texting in his car and he swerves and hits another car or something like that? Is, do you mean look into the future to see that? Yeah. 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 As um, far as predicting, you know, the, the week's worth of future accidents and then the emergency room like you were talking about, is, is that yeah, I mean, really I, so, reality? Um, it's not reality yet, but I, I, think it, I think it will be reality. So it's one okay. of these things where I'm looking sort of forward um, into what I think is probable. Um, and I think that there are people who are really good at predicting. I know that there are good people who are good at predicting accidents. Now they're not working in an emergency room doing staffing. But mm -hmm. um, And when you say that you know, when you use the word accident, it makes it sound like it's, it's, it's kind of an uh, oxymoron because we're talking about predicting an accident, and I see what you're saying. But, you know, we don't, right now, the scientific community is kind of in a transition decade or maybe two decades where there's very little agreement about what's going on with time. So you've got some people who are very, you know, very sure that you... Um, we all live in this block universe, and everything that will ever happen exists kind of like a loaf of bread, and we're going through these slices of bread. And um, so if you're going to get an accident, you're going to get in an accident, period. And there's other people who think that you're looking at probabilities. So there's an 80% probability that on Thursday you'll get into an accident. You know, But yeah. you also, we don't know if you're going to be on the 20% side or on the 80% side, right? And if you don't get in the accident, it didn't happen to you, and you'll say, well, you were wrong. But, you know, it's just... Where, where do you place yourself in, in that... I'm, I'm feeling like I struggle with it literally every day because um, I go back and forth on that. The, the physical evidence looks like it's kind of both from the physics. The, uh, the, the sort of philosophical arguments look convincing on both sides. The, um, the neuroscience data, you could also explain. So, like, everything looks like it's sort of 
equivocal, meaning that either argument could work or either story could work. My, my feeling, this is an intuition, and all of these, at a certain point, the data, uh, the data sets stop, and then it's all interpretation and intuition, right? And that's kind of the fun part of science, looking at the data and then coming up with some kind of interpretation. And so for me, where I'm at is this intuitive interpretation, which could easily be just 100% bunk. But having said that, I, I feel like there's these... Oh God, every time I say this, I, I feel like in three years I'm going to be like, that was so wrong. But on the other hand, I feel that every time I say something like this. And sometimes I'm right. It's okay. That's true. <laughs> Probably most scientists. You know, you yeah. Know, I think the name of the game is being willing to revise your views based on new data, right? Yeah. The name of the game is not knowing. If you, As soon as you know, you're definitely for sure wrong when you know. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely don't know if this is true. Um, this idea that there is, I'm putting my hand in a fist. Like there's a, there, the fist is like, there's a landmark here in space-time. And then there's a landmark here in space-time and a landmark over here. So let's say there's three landmarks, A, B, and C. And those things kind of have to happen. Like those are embedded in space-time. Those are going to happen. But how you get from landmark A to B and B to C is up in the air. And I, I call this the landmark and path model. So there's the landmarks and then there's the path. And so there's some, there's some lack of predetermination in the path but there's predeterminations in the landmarks. The reason this is so unsatisfying to um, one of the reasons this, this model would be so un- unsatisfying to physicists is because they're trained to believe the universe is not personal. So what's a landmark for me? In this, they would think would have to be a landmark for everyone else, but that doesn't seem to be how it works. It, intuitively, it seems like the ones that are important to me. Are, don't matter to you at all. You could be walking by on the street while my mother's dying of cancer, and that's a landmark for me, Absolutely. and it's not for you. So it ends up suggesting that the universe is very personal, but I think there's other reasons to suggest that the universe is very personal. But, but you could scale that in any direction, I would imagine. You could say, what is the trend for a community? Or what is the trend for a city? Yeah, yeah, you could a, start... A country, a, 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 a world a population, a species. yeah. So I, I can't help but wonder, I'm sure you've given thought to this, uh, as fast as our world is changing in so many ways and technology and, and these types of things, sort of uh, you know, non-quantifiable sciences, you know, really is science, but we're still so early that you know, we can't point to you know, real serious blocks of data and say this is exactly what it is and this is why. We're still kind of dealing with a lot of unknowns, even though we know that we're dealing with the type of science. How... How do you think about how society might change or culture might change in just the very near future, three to five years? Are, are we heading in a good direction? Or I'm sure we're heading in multiple directions. Do you have any, <laughs> you know, have any thoughts about you know, how all of this you know, rapid change? We're clearly at you know, the steep part of the hockey stick in so many ways. Yeah. Uh, where, where, do, where do you see us going? Well, a couple things. First of all, I think everyone always thinks they're at the steep part of the hockey stick. I think, I think every generation thinks they're at the steep part of the hockey stick because they are. Because it's always, change is always faster than it was in the past. It keeps speeding up. And so you're, it's true that you're always at the steep end of the hockey stick because of that the hockey stick is exponential. Um, but in, in, say, the 1700s, yeah. one decade was probably very much like the next. In well, the that's what it looks like to us. One decade is very, very different. That's what it looks like to us. But back in the 1700s, they were like, have you seen those new wheels on those carriages? Things aren't changing so quickly, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all relative. Um, so, but in terms of the future, uh, people ask me that a lot. And it's, it's starting to become this risk because while I am a scientist who has all these intuitions and I work on intuition and I do have controlled precognition practice and I'm decent at it, but I'm not amazing... I'm not the right person. I'm sort of not the right person to ask about that. But, and yet I want to answer because I have intuitions about it. So I'm going to answer in two different ways. Okay. One way is to tell you the right person to ask about it, or not the right group of people, is um, Stephen Schwartz has this project called the 2050 Project. Stephen Schwartz is this researcher who's done just tons of remote viewing work and has found a lot of, you probably know about him, your listeners probably know, but... I will definitely find out. I'm not personally yeah. familiar, but he sounds like a really interesting guy. Yeah, and he he did the um, a bunch of he has been doing a bunch of archaeology projects where they go find they use remote viewing to go find 
um, artifacts. Oh, and they do it very successfully. But he also has this project of asking excellent remote viewers to look into the year 2050 and find out what it's like. And he only sort of talks about the pieces that multiple viewers have come up with okay. as a way to sort of some get some kind of... Yeah, because, of course, we can't test if he's right yet, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things he came up with that I really... Um, coming back to my intuition, um, that I intuitively feel will happen that will be very positive is finding a source of energy that is practically free, if, if not free, um, and extremely plentiful. And that's going to shift. So that, and then teleportation. And now Steve, really? S Stephen didn't ever talk to me about teleportation. I don't know if his remote viewers see that. I see that like crazy. Like, do you know how much of our culture is about well, getting one thing to another place? It's kind of like getting 3D printing to the absolute you know, maximum it can be. And, you know, transporting the physical structure just via electronic information right. to another place. Right, or a person. And then your uploadable consciousness in turn, because our neurons, you know, function in a binary fashion, right? Which No, can... let's just nip that puppy in the bud. Oh, they don't? The, no, also that... I that's what I heard somewhere. So no, I know. Please. But I, I, it just, when I, was in, when I was in college and the teachers were telling us that neurons are binary, they hit a threshold and that's one or zero, I just felt just like these other things that... People say, there's certain things where I can feel that it's not true. And I knew that it wasn't true. And uh, I didn't find out until about 15 years later why. And it's because um, there's, there, is a, there is a threshold, but there's also a graded response. The graded response matters. The glial cells around the neurons have this graded response that's not one or zero. That matters. And it turns out just very recently there was a discovery um, that electrical fields that are produced by the brain can jump from one part of the brain to another part of the brain without connections and cause an impact on the neurons. So we don't understand how the brain works is a really good summary of how the brain works. Okay. <laughs> so, so the point is, I don't know how we'll be teleporting people, um, but I have this... Uh, so those two changes, the plentiful um, energy and teleportation of people and first objects and then people... Are, is really going to change the structure of how things work because there's so much of our culture that's around moving things from one place to another, mm -hmm. like all these roads, not so necessary if you can teleport people everywhere and objects everywhere, right? All these cars, very well, different. In terms of teleportation, what happens to the original body? The original body vanishes and appears somewhere else or a duplicate of the body is scanned and then reconstructed somewhere else? Yeah, we're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like we would double the Earth's population pretty quickly. Um, if that kind of thing is coming and 3D printing gets to the point where it can construct organic matter and then infuse it with life somehow, you know, even on a cellular level, which is really not that far-fetched. Yeah. People are heading in that direction sure. now. Yeah. Um, do you get any intuition that we're headed to a point of uh, conquering death? I don't know. That's one of those things I don't care about. So okay. the problem is that um, I feel like this idea of conquering death is just an egoic fantasy about like the desire of the individual to live forever. Okay. <laughs> so I don't care. Like I hope we don't conquer death because then people will get to decide that they're powerful forever. Yeah. Then it becomes a you know a thing <laughs> with the haves and the have-nots, and you know we get into the Elysium. Type well, also of people don't get to have the amazing insight that comes when you don't have your body, and you're like, oh, thank God, I'm done with this body. Okay. <laughs> so as, as far as the sort of ascended view of time, where time becomes like simultaneous, and you can go different points in time. Let's take it backward, because I'm really a history buff, especially the ancient Oh, you want to go to the past. So like, I never think about the past. What, can, can that be done? Can, can you get to, together with a historian and say, hey, look, you know, with, uh, with one of the Peloponnesian Wars, we know this and this and this, but we don't know this. Can there are in? people who are good at that. There are, there are remote viewers who do retrocognition as opposed to precognition, which is sort of my focus. And so they do mental time travel to the past, and they get information. And um, I think Stephen uh, Schwartz, because he does this archaeology stuff, he uses some of those folks to find out what happened, and therefore where might we find this artifact. Do you know what I mean? Oh, okay. So like if I'm on the ship that's going down, what's it like, and, and what's it look like around me, and then where might I find the artifact? So I think you're going to have a really good conversation with Stephen. Oh, so so that's, that's happening now, huh? Wow, yeah, he's that's... doing that stuff, yeah. Oh, 
Very exciting. I've got to, uh, got to get him in touch with uh, Daniele Bellelli and uh, Dan Carlin. Now, those are two of my favorite history podcasters. Those guys are Oh, yeah, you have to do that. Amazing. I'd like, love to make that connection. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Daniele Bellelli is a history professor at UCLA. Cool. And, uh, you know, he's got a you know, very successful podcast. And, and he's made what can be a very dry subject has made it vibrant and exciting to everybody. Cool. And uh, I just absolutely love his work. And he's got this really thick Italian accent. So he's, cool, clearly, he's talking yeah. about Italian history. Uh, just, <laughs> it fits right in. He's, he's got one on uh, Caravaggio. Yeah. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff on Rome. And you've t- you talk about these, uh, you know, guys with their swords strapped on, you know, yeah, spreading through the streets, leather, of, little, yeah. streets of Venice in the, you know, 1400s or something like that. I mean, it just comes alive. You that's amazing. He's a great guy. So he, yeah, he would love this kind of stuff. I, I would. I'm wondering if you're interested in. There's one thing I'd love to get out there when I yeah. do podcasts. If you're interested in talking about, is the emotional and, and spiritual changes that people go through when they pick up controlled precognition as a practice. Can we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. that's something. So my husband's Brooks Palmer. He's sitting here too, and he's seen me. He has watched me train myself and get trained. My trainer was John, John Vivanco, and now he's my teacher. We, we teach, my, my, sorry, I should say that again. He, he was my original trainer for controlled precognition. He called it remote viewing. I do a subset of remote viewing called controlled precognition where no one knows what the target is, and no one in the world knows what the target is until it's revealed after you're done gathering the information. And now John Vivanco and I teach classes on this together, and we both see people transform their lives because what it's doing is you're learning about yourself you're going inside to find this information from the whole rest of the universe it is the coolest thing ever and my life has really uh developed a center around my controlled precognition practice and i thought maybe my husband could say a few words about that because he sees me get stressed out in the day and you know having a usual day with all the busyness and then go into my office and Go do my controlled precognition, and then he sees me come out. Absolutely, Brooks, take it away. Oh uh, well, I could say that um, it's it, it's like if she had gone to sit and meditate for a while, because when she comes out of doing the controlled precognition, because she's in her office and the door's closed, you know, um, she comes out and she looks refreshed, she looks brighter, like she took a nap, you know, and um, and there's a certain peacefulness about her, and. Um, I also think too that she's um, she's very it comes very naturally to her to do this the pre cog work, um, but I but I do think that it it has a way for a person to to go with and you could say and and use those natural instincts that are there just but usually just untapped, and and it creates a vibrancy because I think a person's internal space expands so they're no longer when you get tired you get stressed you get constricted. And then everything's overwhelming, but by going with it in this particular way, there's an expansiveness that comes, and you get a peace of mind as a result of that. And 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 um, your intuition gets a lot more vibrant. I think more a lot more sensitive. You're able to pick up clues and signals that are just basically out there, like radio waves. Awesome. And, and I think she taps into that. Well, let, let me ask you about something else in, in that regard. Um, are there any uh, substances uh, one can use? Any kind of enhancers? Any plant medicines? Anything like that that can can further this work? Uh, because you talk about uh, like getting in a meditative state, and oftentimes, you know, as great as meditation is as a practice, people can sometimes meditate for years before they, you know, really see any tangible results. But you know, if uh, a person uses a, a plant medicine of some sort, they're pretty well guaranteed something's going to happen. And if they're in a the type of environment that's you know controlled and you know very mindful, oftentimes you know some very good things can happen. There can be some very useful results. So do you do you have any experience uh, with with this type of approach? So I stay away from uh, plant medicine because of a family history of mental illness, and um, so I'm very clear about that for me. But I created this website uh, at thepremonitioncode.com. If you click on positive precog training. It's totally free, and you can take yourself through the practice with randomly selected images or words that show up as your target. And, and so that's all explained in the book, too, so that in the premonition code, so you can learn how to do that. Mm-hmm. 
And the point is that people can then experiment. So some people I know are really interested in plant medicine. Other people are interested in ketamine. People are interested in um, having an orgasm and seeing if after sex they perform better. You know, so I just wanted to give everyone the tool because I don't want to have to deal with the institutional review board process of having to request illegal substances to do an experiment. It's easier just to let people... um, in do legal substances in a clinical setting that's mindful um, and, and play with this free resource and see. And that I, I, I want to create a community where people can experiment and have other scientists, they can use the same, they can use that resource as a way to do their experiments. I just want it out there so that we can have a whole world of people who are starting to learn about their own skills. Any, anyone can do this at a basic level. And if you practice... Uh, it, it, because you're dedicated to it and because you enjoy it, you can get better and better. And you don't have to use any um, substances and maybe some substances help. I'm noticing that uh, I think my hormone hormonal cycles make a big difference, and I've talked with several other women hmm. where that's the case. And so I think there's a lot to learn here, and I just encourage people to try it and and learn it and be safe, be careful, and yet have fun. Well, that's interesting. You just by the simple act of, of doing your work, you would emerge uh, feeling better. It, do you find yourself in a? I don't know what the right word is. A, a, a you know a dimension, a, you know another level of consciousness that is more vibrant with energy, and you find yourself you know get it infused with that energy somehow. Is My that- experience is almost like this reality that we're sitting in right now is sort of the story reality, and that when I go in and do my controlled precog practice, I'm getting in touch with reality reality. So oh, it feels okay. more real to me. Okay. And it's more, it feels, I feel more full of myself, like full of life. I feel like I'm really there, really doing it, really in contact with sort of the universe that comes to me. Yeah. And so um, it feels like the opposite of a drug trip. It feels like a sanity trip almost. Interesting. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah, I, I really, I, it's very grounding and it's satisfying and it makes, oh, the other thing it does is, by the way, because I work with my future self and ask her questions, like the self that knows the answer to the question, like, hey, is it like this or that? And I've developed this loving relationship with my future self where we send love back and forth over time. That's how it feels. I mean, it could be a metaphor. I don't care what it is, but it feels like that. And I feel like that has made me so much stronger and authentically connected to myself because it's like I'm safe. My future self is there. I'm here. Like, I'm good. It feels good. Now, when you're working with students, and either in your online community, or I don't know if you work with people personally in live classes or, or yeah, anything like that, um, what is a way for a person to know or for you to be able to tell somebody, say, hey, you're, you're gifted at this. This is something you can really pursue and do well yeah. versus somebody that says, you know, look, as, as interested you, as you are, in this, it's going to take a lot of hard work for you to succeed. And oh, it's you... easy to tell because we use, um, that's the great thing about controlled precognition, we use randomly selected targets. So you do your session, which means you're um, for the most part, for most people they're drawing on a sheet of paper, writing down their impressions and words and adjectives and trying to sense into what the target is. And then when it comes time to the tar- to get the target, it's very clear <laughs> if they've if they've contacted the target and if they repeatedly have trouble either don't get any impressions or repeatedly cannot contact the target maybe after the trying for you know three months or something then it's likely that they'll need to do a lot more work than most people to get it but most people the first time out get some kind of impression of the target and over time improve immensely what what percentage of the general population would, would you think has enough of a natural gift at this to be successful in some degree, even if they wanted to maybe do... As a uh, career, you mean? Either as a career or to have it be useful to them. Yeah, if they wanted to do like... stock trading or something. Or, yeah, or just help their friends with their career Mm -hmm. choices or whatever it is, sure. Um, Oh, God, I think... Has a gift. No one walks in the door and immediately is operational because they need to learn kind of the technical elements of it. But um, let's say 1% of people are pretty close to almost operational when they walk in the door. And then I would say another 40% of people don't, don't need much, maybe a year of practice. Oh, okay. And then the remainder probably would never do a year of practice because they would hate it because they would... You know how you like things you're good at? Mm-hmm. So sure. I think that other group of people would probably not 
like it because they wouldn't feel good at it. Is it like musical talent a little bit? Is it I think it's like musical or athletic analogy? talent. Like yeah. most people, you can get them to play twi- Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the piano, yeah. you know, but some people come in and you play that and then they go, oh, I'm, I wrote the symphony, you know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we're probably running short on time here. Is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know about your work or how to find you or anything that's sure. just up to the minute, uh, you know, latest and greatest in, the, in this particular field? Sure, latest and greatest. Um, uh, let's see, you can always go to mossbridgeinstitute.com to find out whatever I'm up to. Also, the premoniticoncode.com. Click on events and classes, and it, I have an insight timer class people might be interested in. And then I'm always doing, John Pavanko and I are always teaching and um, online. We do online classes. They're fairly affordable. And, um, yeah, I think mostly I'm really interested right now beyond those classes and in, beyond precognition, I'm interested in trying to understand the mechanisms of time. And so I created a crowdfunding experiment that has to do with quantum mechanics and time. And you can learn more about that at I think it's www.tinyurl.com slash future photons. Okay. So. Well, that is awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Yeah, and thanks, Rob. It has really been awesome and been enlightening. Uh, once again, this is Rob Rowe standing in for uh, Debbie Dashinger at the uh, Conscious Life Expo, February 2019. Over and out, and uh, see you online. <laughs> see you online. Thanks, Rob. Sure. That's a nice conversation, though, the way you work. Is- hey, everybody, this is Dr. Dane here, and I would like to invite you to an adventure in being. I've just written and finished a new book known as Being You, Changing the World. Are you one of those dreamers? One of those people who's always known that other possibilities should be available but haven't yet been able to see them be created? Well, I wrote this book for you. In it, you'll find tools, processes, and unique perspectives to change the things you've always wanted to change but didn't know how. In it, you'll find an invitation to a different possibility for a way that we can be in this world that changes not only our lives, but by being us, allows us to contribute to changing everything planet-wide that doesn't work. Are you aware that truly great people, truly being them, is the only thing that has ever created a great change on this planet? Are you willing to step up? Are you willing to be one? Check out a copy of my new book, Being You, Changing the World. I invite you to go to beingyoubook.com for a free gift. What books are you reading? Are you ready for a must-read? Winner of the Inspirational Book of the Year Award and International Best Sellers, Dare to Dream, This Life Counts by Debbie Dashinger, as well as the acclaimed Wisdom to Success, The Surefire Secrets to Accomplish All Your Dreams. Buy the books from Amazon today. U.S. Book Review and Writer's Digest said these are critics' picks by Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, and Wisdom to Success contain gems to live your life by. To contact the award-winning syndicated Dare to Dream radio show, go to DebbieDashinger.com. Keep your excellent feedback and comments coming. Your host, Debbie Dashinger, is an expert at goal achievement, a media personality, an international best-selling author, and a keynote speaker. Debbie leads high-quality teleseminars on how to achieve goals, how to be a self-published best-selling author, and how to get booked on radio. All classes are at DebbieDashinger.com. Debbie's best-selling books are Dare to Dream. This Life Counts, sold on Amazon, and her second book, Wisdom to Success, The Secrets to Accomplish All Your Dreams, sold online at all bookstores. Tune in again to hear the next inspiring interview guest who has turned their vision into a successful reality. Want more support in making your dreams come true? Go to DebbieDashinger.com. That's www.debbi.com. D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com. You'll see videos, MP3s, archived interviews, and amazing products sharing the secret steps to making your dreams come true. Remember to dream big with every expectation that your dream will become real. Dreams are free, so free your dreams. What do you dare to dream? I'm standing now, waiting for my time to be all that I can be. It's so easy to forget, life is 
It's impossible no more. 